Do you want to get a map paper? Just for the trip. Okay. So I think we're good. Okay. [noise] You guys can hear me okay? If we bend down a little bit, we could probably transcribe that. Okay, sorry [laughs] that was [laughs] Yeah, we're getting, we're getting very cozy. Hi, good evening. [noise] My name is Amanda Wroblewski. I'm the program coordinator for the BCH Pillar Program. And I would like to welcome you to our lecture tonight on medication-assisted treatment, which is abbreviated MAT. What is it and why do we use it? Um, I'd like to start with a little bit of housekeeping. First, let's go over the format for tonight's lecture. The discussion portion will last about forty or so minutes. Afterwards, we'll use the remaining time for questions. Please type your short, general questions in the chat box, which should be to the right of your video on your screen. We'll do our best, um, time allowing, to get to the, all the questions we can, um, and please feel free to enter questions at any time during the discussion. Don't, don't have to wait till the end. There will also be a resource list at the end of the slide show that, um, we encourage you all to check out. So you can reach myself, um, my colleague Shelby, or either of our speakers tonight. Second, thank you so much for tuning in, for those of you joining us live or those that are watching the recording later. Um, your support of our programming and your interest in learning more about public health in the community means the world to us. So thank you, we appreciate it. Because you're here showing support, I want to be transparent and try to appropriately manage expectations for tonight's presentation. What this presentation will not be is a cure or treatment for your individual situation or an easy answer to the huge issue that is addiction and addictive behaviors. What it will be is an opportunity to learn more about brain science and the success of MAT as an intervention, a way to learn how to address something that you maybe still be holding onto and start a journey of healing. <sighs> Sorry, it's hurting my legs. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to highlight, too, that this is all a very personal and potentially painful journey that does require work. Um, but overall, we want to send the message of hope that recovery is so possible and there are so many avenues to get there. So with that, I will introduce tonight's speakers. Here we have Jessica Zeme, Manager of Administrative Operations and Coordinator of Program Services at Denver Recovery Group West here in Boulder. She's also a certified addictions counselor, level one. And Carla Cahey, BCH nurse practitioner who is duly board certified as a family nurse practitioner and adult clinical nurse specialist. Sorry, I stumbled over that it's a fine. little bit. Fine. Um, so ladies, take it away and we'll um, take some questions afterwards. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so as Amanda said, I work at Denver Recovery Group. Um, we are a outpatient treatment facility, and um, sorry, I'm still on the outline. And we treat people with medication-assisted treatment that have opiate use disorder, um, also known as OUD. Uh, at our company, we provide individual counseling, group counseling, uh, in-house doctor appointments, on-staff nursing, blood draws, UAs health screens, all of that. Um, our groups vary from anywhere from CBT, DBT, uh, anger management, psychoeducation, uh, relapse prevention. And we have five locations in the state of Colorado. Uh, we have, like Amanda said, one in Boulder. We have one in Denver. We have one in Lakewood, Colorado Springs, and Littleton. Uh, we accept Medicaid, Medicare, self-pay, VA, and then we also are lucky enough to have grant funding to help those who don't quite qualify for Medicaid and don't have the funds to afford treatment. Uh, our model is harm reduction. So harm reduction is designed to lessen the negative behaviors and decrease health risks and meet patients where they're at in their treatment. It's a non-judgmental approach, and this creates an opportunity for um, a healthier life for those patients who come to our treatment facility. Uh, so we use three different types of medications, um, and just a quick, quick explanation of each one. Uh, we primarily use, um, we have about, I'd say 95% of our patients are on methadone. Uh, methadone is a fully synthetic medication. It's slow ac acting and it is a full agonist. It helps to alleviate the withdrawal symptoms, decrease cravings, and reduce the experience of a high when using other opiates. 
Um, it was first created in the 1930s during World War II, and um, that was used as a replacement to morphine. And then we also uh, have buprenorphine. About 5% of our patients are on buprenorphine. Uh, it's a partial agonist, and it helps reduce the cravings, um, and it was created in the 1960s and is a sublingual medication, uh, typically either a film or a tablet that goes under the tongue and dissolves. And then we have Vivitrol. Uh, Vivitrol is an antagonist that binds to the receptors, preventing the high and reduces the desire for use. Uh, Vivitrol can be uh, known for three different forms. Um, it can be the Vivitrol, which is a once a month injection. Uh, there's naltrexone, which is the daily pill form of Vivitrol. And then there's naloxone, which is more commonly known as Narcan. Um, and that's actually a typo on my slide. I apologize. It's actually to reverse an overdose, not reduce. Hmm. Um, but that's you know, uh, usually given in a, a nasal form. Um, and that is the general explanation of all our medications. Oh, uh -oh. Um, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> hit the wrong button. Uh, so this is kind of a, a picture to demonstrate what the how the medications work on the receptor. So keep this picture in mind. I'm actually going to move to the next slide uh, to explain it a little further. Um, but this is the blown up version of it. So this is. Um, so the, the, the blue portion of it, the bottom portion, um, is what our receptors look like on our brain. And the, the one farthest to the left is the example of methadone. Uh, the one in the middle is buprenorphine, and the one on the far right is Vivitrol. So to get a, just a picture of how these work on the brain, um, I like to look at it as having three cups. One cup filled with water, uh, one cup filled with golf balls, and then one covered with saran wrap. So the one filled with water is fully filling the receptor, um, which prevents that withdrawal, prevents the craving. That's methadone. The one in the middle is golf balls, um, and that doesn't fully fill it. So it, it's, that's what it is. It, it partially fills the receptor. And then uh, the last one on the right is the saran wrap that doesn't allow anything into the receptor. Um, this next picture is just a chart to describe how um, each medication works on the brain. So uh, the, the bottom line is the antagonist that is Vivitrol. The middle one is a partial antagonist, that's buprenorphine, and then the top one is methadone. Um, and just for a comparison here, buprenorphine is a wonderful medication. It works for a ton of people. Um, the, but the, the max dose that you can be on for buprenorphine relates to about 60 to 70 milligrams of methadone. And on average across the country, the average methadone dose at a therapeutic level is 120 milligrams of methadone. Um, so unfortunately, just with stronger and stronger opiates out there, such as fentanyl, um, sometimes buprenorphine is just not enough to help those who are using fentanyl um, and it, it, IV heroin use as well. So uh, we just have to keep that in mind when prescribing medications. Uh, this is a, a graph to demonstrate. Um, the one on the left is um, uh, someone who's using opiates, um, that I think they specifically say heroin in this one. Uh, so that middle bracket, um, the top one is when you're high, the bottom one is when you're in withdrawal, and then that middle one is quote unquote your normal level. So someone who's actively using is hardly ever into that normal uh, level. So they're really never feeling great. They're either, you know, they're high or they're in withdrawal and they're sick and they're not feeling well. And then the one on the right is someone who has been stable and is on a therapeutic dose of methadone. And as you can see, they never leave that normal section. Um, and then if you can see, it's a, the faint line, dotted line on the far right picture is uh, someone, if they were to taper off their medication, they would go into that sick state if they didn't do it properly. Uh, so we have expectations for our patients in medication-assisted treatment. Like I said earlier, we're an outpatient treatment facility. Um, there are, we are highly regulated, so there is a lot of requirements that come with our facility. Um, we do have an intake process, and then once they've done their intake and they're an established patient, they're coming into the clinic just for you know a minute to five minutes, depending if there's a little bit of a line. We require individual counseling, and that's at least an hour a month. Usually when they're newer patients, we see them more often to help stabilize. Uh, we require five groups. Um, one of them is an orientation group, and then we require four others, uh, which were de designed as psychoeducation groups to really make sure we're setting the patients up for success and giving them all the information they need. 
Um, and part of this, that is the pharmacology, part of it is the rules of our facility, um, how to address stigma, and how to give them tools just to be out in the community on medication-assisted treatment since it is so highly stigmatized. Uh, we do UA's year analysis in-house. Uh, we require at least once a month, and they're all completely random. We have extensive drug screen panels. They're really fun to, you know, dive into um, and see the metabolites of everything and, and really get a good, good idea of what people are using. And a lot of times our patients don't even know what they're using, so it's, it's good for an educational piece for them as well. Uh, we do individual treatment planning. That's uh, a big part of what we're, we t are proud of. Uh, everything is individualized with our patients. We meet them where they're at, and we help them where they're at and see what we can do to help better their lives. Um, a cool part about medication-assisted treatment is once a patient's stabilized, uh, they're giving clean UAs, they're compliant with treatment, they can start earning takeouts um, and not have those daily uh, to-do items of coming to the clinic. And we also provide uh, peer services at our clinic. A little bit about coordinating care with Denver Recovery Group and the intake process with us. So we accept walk-ins Monday through Friday. Intakes take priority with us. Um, our Boulder office is open from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the intake process takes about three hours. So I always like to let everyone know that just to keep it in mind, uh, not to show up at 12 o'clock and think that it's all going to get completed all in that one day. Uh, but we do have something that's really unique to Colorado um, and actually most of the country. We have um, our Denver location is open till 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, and we accept intakes all the way up until that 8 p.m. time. Uh, our model is really just to make treatment more available. Sometimes, you know, if someone's working, it's hard to get in at those early hours, all of that. So um, if we do have a Boulder patient that needs to go to our Colfax office to do the intake, they're more than welcome to, and then the next day they just return to our Boulder office uh, and continue their treatment there with us. We have a wonderful opportunity uh, where we have transportation uh, to get patients to and from the clinic for their intake appointment. Um, we love to help with coordination of care, so if we can get an ROI, we, we, you know, we're happy to provide that. Um, and if you want to coordinate into an intake, just give us a call. Um, like Amanda said earlier, our phone numbers will be listed. My direct phone number will be listed, the clinic phone number, and my email. So if you know anyone, if you want to reach out about any more information on intakes, I'm happy to help out and answer those questions. Thank you, Jessica. I love your cup analogy. <laughs> Thank you. That's <laughs> perfect. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what Matt looks like at BCH. So ours is a little bit different because it's integrated into our um, healthcare system. It isn't a system that's designated specifically for treatment, so it's sort of um, an integrated process. Uh, we do not offer methadone so that you would have to go to a treatment center for, but we do offer buprenorphine, so that's Suboxone, and then some clinics are able to do Vivitrol or Naltrexone. There are a couple ways that you can enter into um, treatment at Boulder Community. Sometimes it results from having a discussion with your primary care provider and you're, no, you're you know, wanting to talk about that as an issue, and then sometimes it, it, um, it comes from that. Sometimes it comes from somebody who's in more of an emergency state and they go straight to the ER and they can be uh, started on Suboxone there. And then sometimes it comes through our uh, pillar patient navigators. So um, Shelby and Amanda are there to kind of field those uh, inquiries and find out where the best place would be for some of these patients um, and if they're suitable for treatment through one of the primary care clinics. Uh, once you're in the system, then you got to figure out how to start the medication. There are a couple different ways to do that. Um, people can start. The, the tricky part is that you have to be in um, a certain amount of withdrawal in order to start Suboxone. And so um, that can be very scary for a lot of people and very nerve wracking. There are scales that you use to kind of figure out, am I there yet? Is this a place where I can start? Um, if you start too soon, then you can uh, feel pretty bad. So it's important that, that somebody wait until the appropriate time. So if there's some fear around that, then doing it in the ER is an option. Um, if you want to do it at your home, that's also an option. It's more comfortable to be in your home when you're doing that. But it's, if it's not something that you want to manage yourself, then, then there are options for that. It can be done in the clinic as well, but uh, that doesn't happen very often, to be honest, because we don't have the resources really to have someone in our clinic all day and have somebody watching them. So really, it's, it's mostly home or ER in my experience. And then ongoing treatment would be with one of the 
um, primary care providers in our clinic that has um, specialized training in prescribing Suboxone. Um, perfect. I, the clicker worked for me <laughs> and did it. Okay. Uh, so some of the benefits to obtaining treatment in a primary care setting, we've got um, the opportunity when, so when you're with um, a, a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA who is used to treating people, um, you know, for their physical and their cancer screenings and all of that. So you're get, you get the opportunity to kind of meld that um, opioid addiction treatment with your regular health care. You can work towards that whole body wellness that um, often gets neglected when someone is seeking for a long period of time. Um, it is a discreet way to get treatment. Um, you get to take the medicine in your own home, which has pluses and minuses. And you get, can get the mental health support through um, the pillar patient navigators help us find those resources. But it's not always all um, in one tidy little location like a treatment center would be. And then um, expectations for uh, being treated in an outpatient setting, you really have to have a highly motivated patient. Um, sometimes people start in one location and they really need a higher level of care and then they'll be moved over. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely something that's evaluated at, at the beginning to see if this is a good fit. Um, there's always a contract, just like with taking any um, pain medication controlled substances, we want to make sure that we have an agreement um, on how the patient will take it and how we will prescribe it. There are random urine drug screens, and then initially there are more frequent visits with the provider um, just to kind of check in, make sure everyone's doing okay, and then just modify the dose as needed. And then as we um, build that trust, it's really the, the foundation of, of treatment. Um, a urine drug screen that has things on it that we wouldn't expect is never really um, cause for dismissal from the program. It's more just an opportunity for conversation and trying to figure out what, how we can do better. And then I wanted to mention that um, both Suboxone and Naltrexone can be really great options for pain management as well. Um, they're dosed just a little bit differently. So Suboxone, when it's being prescribed for opiate use disorder, usually take it just once a day. And then if you have someone who um, maybe has a history of addictive behavior or is having a hard time with their opiates, um, transitioning to Suboxone for pain, spreading that medication out throughout the day can be quite helpful. Um, naltrexone is also used in low doses for things like fibromyalgia. And so if you have somebody who has overlapping conditions, it can be really helpful. And then I just wanted to mention the goals Everybody has different goals for why they um, get into prescribing Suboxone. So here's my little pitch for um, any prescribers out there that might be interested. Um, really through uh, one of our goals in healthcare for a lot of us is to continually work toward social justice. And what, we c what we're doing is we're trying to reduce barriers to care, reduce health disparities, and make it easier for people to get what they need. And so by offering Matt in a primary care setting, it's one way that we can do that. The more the better. Do you want to stop and do some questions now or do you want me to go into the mix? Um. Yeah, I want to back up just a little bit. There were some terms um, that you guys had used. So can you explain stigma just a little more? Like why why is this stigmatizing? Why are people what are the barriers with stigma? What are the the misconceptions, just dive into that a little bit. Because, um, I mean, I know the word gets used a lot, but do we really know what it means and how are we using it here in the setting of substance use disorder treatment? Yeah. Do you want to start us off with that? Yeah. No? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I <will. laughs> so stigma is a huge, huge thing in the medication-assisted treatment world. Um, at Denver Recovery Group, we spend a lot of time educating our patients on the stigma and what they can do to help transform the stigma um, because what happens with a lot of our patients is if they are hiding that they're on methadone or buprenorphine, whatever medication that they're on, but they're doing well. They are, um, they have a job, they have the house, they are doing everyday normal activities. Um, a lot of them are hiding it. 
so there's not really success, success stories of buprenorphine and methadone and Vivitrol being put out there. Um, so by doing that alone, they're hurting the, the reputation of medication-assisted treatment. Um, it's a lot of the times that the patients that aren't doing well, um, and it, you know that's the stuff that comes up on the news or something, and it's always the negative stories. Um, so we really want to try and advocate and have our patients learn those tools um, and help give them the skills to advocate for themselves and address the stigma that's out there. Um, and anytime they can educate someone on medication-assisted treatment, that's why we do um, one of those groups I was talking about earlier where we teach them on the pharmacology um, and really explain how it works on the brain and how it helps their brain heal from all that illicit opiate use in the past. Um, but stigma is, is huge. I mean, it affects medication-assisted treatment in so many ways. Um, I mean, 80% of patients that are on, me on methadone report stigma, um, whether it's with their primary care doctors, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's with their friends and family. Um, they, they have a lot of, they, I mean, everyone just thinks, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the myths here that a lot of people um, end up contributing that to, but um, I think it's 89% of the public um, has a negative thought process on medication-assisted treatment. Um, it's a really real thing. Uh, we've faced a lot of barriers trying to open treatment facilities um, throughout the five, six years that we've been um, established in Colorado. Um, our, our Denver location was um, barely able, I mean, it was, we had to fight to get it open. It was, uh, if you guys ever heard of NIMBY, it's not in my backyard. It's a very real thing. Um, there, you can Google it and learn all about it, but it, it's really just the, the barriers they face. A lot of people just think that it, they're another, it's just another drug. Um, they're replacing one drug for another, um, you know, that it, it's done all these things to them that are really negative. And, and that's my interpretation of stigma. I don't know if you, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was great. No. Did I answer your question, Amanda? You did. That <laughs> okay. was fabulous. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Um, and just kind of backing up a little further to, to the, um, description of the medications, can you all explain the difference between monobuprenorphine and suboxone? What's, what makes suboxone different from just the one drug? So suboxone is a combo drug where it's got buprenorphine plus naltrexone, so um, it's it or naloxone. So it's it's comboing and it's not allowing people to really um, overdose on it or abuse it. Do you have a better way to? Nope, that's okay. yeah. So yeah, there's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. We can probably um, talk about some of the myths. Give a little more time for questions. Okay. Um, so some of the sorry, I'm gonna. Scroll scroll down so I can see my notes here on this part. Um, so one of the biggest ones is methadone gets in my bones. Um, and that's not true. Methadone does not get into a, a patient's bones. What it is is when people are going through withdrawal, um, which is typically happening when they're, it's almost always happening when they're stabilizing on, on their dose, um, they're withdrawing. So they're achy, their body hurts. Um, that's an, a natural body reaction to happen there. It's not actually getting into your bones. It's just your body's reaction to feeling sick, um, and not filling those endorphins and, um, just causing normal body aches. Um, another one that comes up often is I'll be on it forever. Um, to me that in itself is stigma. Um, it's having a negative connotation to being on a medication for chronic relapsing disease. Um, and I think that's something I personally haven't said enough. This is addiction is a chronic relapsing disease. Um, and um, to me saying that, you know, it's okay. If you wanna get on methadone, you wanna stabilize, you wanna get to that therapeutic dose, and then you wanna taper off in the proper way. Our doctors are happy to help patients through that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with going that route, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with staying on a medication that's saving your life for the rest of your life either. Um, a lot of people feel like they need to get on it and then they need to get off of it and they want to do it in six months. The reality is, is the, the damage that they've done to their brain is it takes a year to three years to heal your brain and to recover those receptors if the day they come into treatment they stop using. If they're still kind of going in and out of using while they're in treatment, their brain's still not getting that chance to heal. Um, so I look at it in a way of if I know someone who is a, is a cancer and they have cancer and they're doing chemo treatment and the chemo treatment's working for them. We would never say, hey, when are you gonna get off that chemo? Or a heart medication. Um, we would never say, hey, you're doing great. Your heart is 
your blood pressure, whatever it is, we would never ask that person to get off a medication that's helping to save their lives. And the reality is if you get off medication assisted treatment, there's a 60 to 80% chance of relapsing. Um, and a lot of those end up leading to overdoses um, because they've lost that tolerance and people always resort back to wanting to use what they were formerly using. Um, so you don't have to be on it forever, but it's certainly okay to be on it forever. And I can't stress that enough with it being a chronic relapsing disease, it is okay to be on medication assisted treatment for the rest of your life. Um, the other one of course is, um, trading one addiction for another. There's a difference, um, between addiction and tolerance and, uh, dependency. So the addictive portion is what causes the negative behaviors, the relationship breaking, the criminal activities, the stealing, all of that. Um, so there's a difference between that. Um, and then another one is methadone has ruined my teeth. Um, so there is, to, to explain this one, methadone does reduce saliva, which helps clean out the bacteria and tartar. Um, but it's not a, it's not a correlation. It's more a byproduct. Um, when we look at it, when you're, you're starting treatment, um, you are usually when you're, you're tapering off those illicit medications, uh, you are typically craving sugars. Uh, so you're eating a lot of junk food. You're eat, drinking a lot of coffee and your sugar, soda, all of those kind of things, um, which isn't good for your teeth, right? Um, throughout your addiction, a lot of patients aren't, going to the dentist, they don't have the best hygiene, they might not be brushing their teeth as often as they should be. So all of that kind of factors in together. Um, and then another one is methadone makes me fat. That's one that I hear more often than not. Um, and methadone has, um, it does reduce your metabolism. However, again, um, when coming into treatment, a lot of patients are craving sugars, um, eating unhealthy foods, um, you know, maybe it's all that they can afford, um, all of the, all those factors come into play here. Um, but also the reality is when uh, you're actively using things like heroin and fentanyl, you're not treating your body the way you're supposed to be. You're, you're seeking out drugs rather than food and the nutrition that your body needs. So when you start to get sober and you realize, hey, I need to start eating better, I need to, your body's just going to hold on to all those things. Um, because it's been at a, a state of anorexia for a while. So those are the big myths um, that come with methadone. I'm not sure. Do you have any, do you want to touch on any of that? You did awesome. Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking a lot. So, <laughs> um, but th those are the big myths that we deal with. We hear those every day. Um, we, we run a group and um, we ask p patients to, you know, list the things that they think that, you know, what, what's been bothering you about methadone and we'll have patients that have been in treatment for two years and they'll come in and say well the methadone made me lose my teeth or you know my teeth rotted out and you know we we like to educate them on this and, and let them know the the actual source behind it so amanda do you have any other questions on this not on this on, on something else okay do you want me to go to the question slide or do you want to um you can go into resources okay Sure. And then um, we'll let some questions trickle in. Okay. Um, so, again, just things that you all have been talking about throughout the discussion have um, been sticking out to me. And Jess, oh, can we back up one? There we go. Perfect. There's the resource slide. Um, Jess, you, you mentioned that, you know, Denver Recovery Group w requires UAs, and some things that show up on the UA, the and uh, UA stands for urine analysis. I don't know if we um, just are using acronyms and not explaining <laughs> to people what they mean. Um, things will show up, and you mentioned that clients aren't even aware mm -hmm. that they took that. Can you explain that a little more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we run, I believe our drug screen panel is about 80 different things on our drug screen panel now. So we're a very extensive um, drug screen panel. A lot of places are doing seven to 12. Um, but we really want to make sure we're getting the metabolites of everything. We want to get the breakdown. We want to get um, how long ago the use was, all of that. Uh, but we'll have... Um, you know, not, not so much now, but recently, I would say probably, you know, two years ago, um, fentanyl would come up very, very rarely. 
Uh, and we would tell a patient, hey, we have a, we have a policy. As soon as we see fentanyl in a UA, we um, put a flag on the patient's chart. They're not allowed to proceed without talking to their counselor and being notified that fentanyl came up in their UA and then educating them on what fentanyl is and trying to help them find the source of it, especially if they're not routine fentanyl users. Um, so we used to have patients that we would tell them fentanyl was in their UA and they would, you know, go completely ghost faced. They'd be very scared. Um, and they'd have no idea. Um, we've seen it come up where someone was like, well, it was maybe methamphetamine use. Um, they've seen fentanyl mixed in with, um, different benzos have been mixed in with things. Um, and with the heroin, a lot of the times now there, there's fentanyl. Um, it's available, it's here, it's cheap. Um, so unfortunately fentanyl's coming up more often than not now. So we really, I mean, that's why we like to have the extensive drug screen panels. We want to notify the patients what's in there. Um, and a lot of the times they really, you know, they're in that desperate state of, they don't, they don't care what they were using or what they were getting, whether or not they knew what they were getting. Um, a lot of the times they don't. And, um, that's just the reality of it. Now, a lot of things are mixed. A lot of it is laced, uh, with different things and it's combinations you wouldn't even expect. I mean, meth methamphetamines and fentanyl were the first time we saw it. We're like, that's such a weird combination, but, uh, we saw it for a while. It was, it was, I don't want to say trending, but it was trending for a while. Um, so yeah, it happens a lot. Can you tell us why fentanyl is so scary? Yeah, I can. Um, so we test for seven different types of fentanyl already. Um, there are seven different strands, each getting stronger and stronger, um, that we test for. And, um, fentanyl is related to like, if you took like a grain of sand and I believe it's, is it a fourth a cup usually what it's related to for heroin um it, it, like that amount of fentanyl can kill you like just a tiny amount um and it's hard um there's test strips out there for fentanyl they i can't speak a ton of that on them and their accuracy but i i've heard they're not the most reliable source because depending where you test it um you might not get the tiny little grain of fentanyl that's in there so it might come up as negative for fentanyl um but fentanyl is extremely scary it's a very strong very strong medication um and it's it's overdosing a lot of uh, a lot of patients there was or a lot of people in general um i know boulder county's been hit with a few fentanyl overdoses in the past couple of months um and it's it's just growing it's getting out there more and more have you seen mat be successful for people that uh routinely use fentanyl yeah definitely um and like i said earlier um methadone is usually the better route for people who are using fentanyl um, just because you can get to those higher levels to even it out. Um, we don't believe in, you know, having a high dose. There are higher doses, of course, with methadone, but there's no such thing. Everyone, you know, so a patient might be on 60 milligrams and that's what works for them. Uh, someone might need to be on 200 milligrams and that's what works for them. Everyone's different. Everyone metabolizes differently and it's based off of your use and how much you've been using. And we've seen with um, fentanyl users where they're on the much higher doses, um, those upward levels, if we're saying the average is 120, you know, maybe 100, and, and I don't know the exact statistic on this, but maybe their average is 160. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely a higher rate, but we've, we've seen success with it. Um, you know, we have throughout the years, and it's, it's definitely something that can be treated and something that methadone definitely helps with fentanyl use. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, Carla, we have a couple questions for you. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, can you go into a little more detail about home induction and just kind of what yeah. that might look like for somebody, kind Absolutely. of step by step, if yeah. that's possible? So for a home induction, I send people home with instructions because when you're going through withdrawal, I understand that it would be really difficult to kind of remember step by step what's going on. Um, you have a scale that you self-assess your physical symptoms and then once you reach a certain threshold, that's when you can start your Suboxone. You would start with one dose and then you kind of reassess how you're doing. It helps uh, stop some of that withdrawal. And then if it comes back in about four hours, then you can redose. You add up the dose that you end up on after doing this for about 24 hours. And then on day two, you take the dose that you ended up with collectively on day one. So if say, you needed, um, you know, eight milligrams total over the first 24 hours, you would just start out day two with eight milligrams all at once. And then on day three, you kind of assess how you did on day two. And so there's a lot of wiggling around as far as, you know, finding the right dose. Um, 
So I try to see people on day two or three or have a phone call with them or something to just kind of walk them through, make sure they're figuring that out right. Um, the easiest way to go through it is, of course, through the ER where you would have someone who's uh, doing that assessment for you. Um, and making sure that you don't do it too early and keeping track of your dose and all of that. Um, but of course, if somebody wanted to do it at home, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I find that most people are pretty scared to do the home induction and I lose some people in the, in the very beginning with that when they hear about it. Um, because understandably people are scared of withdrawal. And so, um, it really does work amazingly well though at, at stopping withdrawal. So. What would you say is the time frame? I heard it, I have understand it's pretty quick after, you know, if somebody's in that withdrawal state waiting to start their first dose, about how long is it before they start to feel better? As far as the withdrawal symptoms? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I would say it's uh, probably five to 15 minutes. What would you, would you agree? Um, so are you saying within the medication for them to stabilize on the dose? To, for it to take away the withdrawal. Oh yeah, I would say, yeah. Quickly. 15 minutes, yeah, it's pretty quick. That's great to hear. And just as a reminder, our emergency room at Foothills at, for BCH does Suboxone induction 24-7. So if there's somebody needing help now, the ED is a, a great place to start. Um, Carla, another one for you. What, um, oh my gosh, I just lost it. <laughs> what would you say to a practitioner that's kind of thinking about getting their feet wet and go down the road of being a Suboxone prescriber? Great question. So I would say it's, it's um, extremely fulfilling because what we all want, whether it's a diabetic, someone with hypertension, someone who's overweight, what we want is a motivated patient. We want somebody who's going to make those changes to change their life for the better, work on those things that are, that are really hard. And it's really uh, quite difficult sometimes when, when people are struggling with that motivation to change and these people are coming in ready to change and it's amazing to be part of that it's amazing to see these people change and and just play that role with them um it's it's an honor really um i would say as well it's it's not hard it it makes it seem hard the amount of education that we have to go through in order to be able to prescribe it um, some of that has changed recently, so some of those barriers are, um, are down, which is good. But uh, a really great way to start sometimes is with someone who's been stable for years and years and years, and they just need to keep their dose going. Mm -hmm. That is a great way to start. Good. That's great advice. I would agree and um, just offer, too, that you know, taking care of oneself is evidence of recovery and certainly evidence of that motivation. Yeah. that you're talking about. Um, another question for you, Carla. How would you suggest somebody start this conversation with their provider? Because um, that can be really scary for Absolutely. people too. So what what would you suggest um, from the, the patient point of view? You know, I think um, if you have a relationship with the provider already, then it, it that provider is not going to come at you with um, judgment. Uh, really what they want is the best for you. So just coming out with open, honest, um, you know, if you need to tell the front desk something else, I have a UTI, I have a cold, whatever, you know, just to get in the door. And then maybe you only want to tell your provider what's going on. That's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that I don't know any providers that would be um, not willing to help. Absolutely. Whether even if they're not um, able to prescribe the treatment, uh, they can they will definitely help you find the resources to, to be able to get that. Yeah, that's great to hear. And we have uh, about half a dozen um, providers at BCH that are um, prescribing Suboxone right now. Yes. So um, there's some options for folks, which is great. So this is one maybe for Jess, but for both of you. Does MAT only treat opioid use disorder? Um, so we do it as only, so we use it as opioid use disorder. Um, Vivitrol can also be treated for alcohol use disorder. Um, and that's really the extent of what we use medication assisted treatment for. Um, I think, you know, there's some, you know, something for methamphetamines. We don't really have a 
um, and, and that's you know, hard. Learn that it's a, that's no. a hard one. We don't have a medication that, you know, cures all with that or, you know, helps. And, and methadone, buprenorphine, all that certainly aren't a cure all. There's, you know, there's a lot that goes behind it. Um, but it's a, certainly a, a huge step in, in, in helping with that. Um, but yes, primarily, yes. From, and, and in our standpoint, yes. Great. Um, so we don't have any more questions in the chat just yet. I'm wondering, though, if each of you, Jess, you made a really good point about, you know, this being stigmatized and that even if people are being successful in treatment and doing well, they're still very, you know, keep it to them, very much keep it to themselves mm -hmm. because they're afraid of that judgment yeah. and that, you know, people will look at them differently or however that may come out. I'm wondering if you can each share with us a success story of maybe a really challenging client or patient that you saw do the work and advocate for themselves and really stick with it and um, has been successful in their recovery. Yeah. Do you want to start off with that? So mine is ever evolving. Um, <laughs> the person I'm thinking of, um, she disappears every now and then and relapses, but then she comes back. She, she always comes back. And we've had to kind of get her into higher levels of care here and there. So, but she's always, she always comes to me and says, I need help and uh, tells me what's going on and we get her help. And so her being brave enough to come to me and say, I messed up. I wish I didn't do this, but this is what I did. Then, you know, absolutely. It, that, that to me is the success because it's, it's an ever evolving back and forth that comfort level to come back and yeah. not feel stigmatized that's awesome uh we also you know model that too of come back if you you know want to if you leave for a little bit you're always welcome back um my my success story that i, I could think of is um we had a, a young girl who got on medication assisted treatment uh, really worked the program did great with it um you know, of course, there's the up and ups and downs, and those are to be expected, and they're okay. It's not something to look back and just drop out because of it. It's going to happen, and it's okay, um, and to learn from it and move forward. Um, and th this particular person did that, and um, now she got her peer certification. Um, she was a peer for a long time and actually just got her uh, level two counseling certification um, and is a counselor and now helping people. Um and has had some really cool stories already. And um, just having that lived experience of medication assisted treatment, and then now turning around at such a young age and turning around and helping people um, that are going through the same thing that she did. And I mean, that's really it. We, we see success stories all the time. It's really great. It's really cool to see someone who comes in when they are just in, you know, they're at their low. Um, and, you know, in a month, maybe they've turned their life completely around. I mean, I get goosebumps every time I think of those patients. And it's just so cool. It's a, And, um, you know, anytime someone asks me what I do and I say I work in the medication-assisted medication, medication -assisted treatment world and everyone just goes, ooh, that must be hard. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, sure, there's, you know, there's the sad days and the hard days, but, like, the rewarding days are so much more worth it and just to see patient success. And we see it every day and someone – coming in and saying, hey, I got a job, or mm -hmm. hey, you know, whatever it, whatever it is, it's so cool. Hey, I got a new car, or all these cool things, or I got to go home and see my parents for the first time in years. Um, you know, that to me just makes it so worth it and just shows that medication-assisted treatment works, and it's awesome. I mean, I love it. Um, I think going back to, you know, what you would say to a patient coming in and, and starting that conversation is, don't be scared. The one, the us who work in this field are, you know, we're happy to have you come in. We're not going to judge you for it. Um, we're we're here to support you. We're here to share our experience with it and help support you through this, um, and meet you wherever you're at. So don't be afraid of it. We've got awesome teams. Uh, Boulder County has done a great job with really educating and creating a great support system out there and and helping patients with substance with opiate use disorder. Yeah, absolutely. Those are both certainly success stories and agreed right it is ever evolving and um the field is changing and a couple things struck me when you when you were both talking one that yes there's a whole community here waiting for people to just ask for the help when they're ready and you know the opposite of addiction is community um so 
there's a really big one um, out there. And then Jess, what you said about peer recovery, peer certification, tell us a little more about that because that can certainly make things less scary as well. Yeah. So, um, we, you know, we have peer options. We, you know, it, it's great, especially, I mean, of p- patients of all ages, but especially our younger population, you come in, you're scared and you almost need someone, you know, to say, to hold your hand and kind of let you know, hey, I've been through this. Um and really help you um, give your their experience, um, you know, so you have someone you can relate to and talk to. There's lots of peer opportunities um, and lots of peer support in Boulder County. Um, there's great peer p- programs out there for anyone who's looking to get peer certified. If you're at that point, um, I th- you know, there's lots of different programs out here for it. But peers are awesome. They um, at our at our fel- facility they do individual uh, peer appointments um so it can be one-on-ones um and then they also lead groups with us and then they also do our intakes which is really cool to be on that intake side because when you come in and you have someone you can relate to rather than sometimes where a counselor may seem more intimidating in that that moment um, a lot of the times it would be a, a peer helping out with that yeah it's certainly um a way the field has been moving is more of that peer and it's exactly what it sounds like right just somebody who has that lived experience, who's been um, in the situation where people are scared and potentially hopeless, um, but the, the peers are living proof that recovery is possible and sobriety is allowing them to thrive. Absolutely. Um, so we don't have any more questions. It's about quarter till. Um, just wondering if you all have any kind of parting thoughts, any any last words of wisdom <laughs> to share about MAT or about this field in general? Um, I mean, I, I could talk a little bit about how, um, like, when you're in your addiction and how it changes, where I was talking about receptors earlier, how that changes um, your receptors in your brain and how yes, that affects please. you and how medication that leads into medication assisted treatment. Oh, absolutely. You hear that? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know if we'd have time for it, so I didn't want to touch too much on it earlier. I'm going to go back to this slide. I usually do this on a whiteboard, so bear with me as I try to walk you through it. Um, so we're going to use one of these graphs, um, just a, as an outline here, um, to kind of help me walk you, walk you through this. Um, so we have endorphins, right? So endorphins mean natural high. So it's that natural thing that we do, um, such as, I don't know, what, what would give you an, uh, a good endorphin? Sex. Sex, exactly. <laughs> um, chocolate, food, you know, our favorite food, going out for pizza, um, all of those things. So if you, if you look exercise. at the exercise, that's a good one too. <laughs> um, so we have these things. So, you know, essentially there's, you know, you, you're at, your low point of endorphins and then um, to go up to your high would be, you know, we max out at, I believe it's a thousand nanograms of endorphins is like our, the, our maxed out natural high and that to get to that a thousand, excuse me, it's a hundred, um, to get to the hundred nanograms um, would be things like the extreme sports, like cliff diving, those things, those really high in- adrenaline things uh, would put us at that max natural endorphin level. Anything higher, our body doesn't naturally do because that's putting at us at a, oh, no, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be over this normal threshold. Um, so I think, you know, like sex would put us at 95 nanograms, um, you know, chocolate, 90, you know, all, the, all those things. They, they can put us up to that high of that, wow, that felt so good, a roller coaster, um, all those things. They, they make us feel good, right? Um, so, you know, things like tobacco use will put you a little bit over that. And then let's say your first high opiate use is going to put you at – uh, 10,000 nanograms and you're going way over. And that's why a lot of times people get sick on their first use, um, because their body's rejecting it and they're saying, whoa, 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 this is way more than what we want. Um, so your body is, whether it's, you know, throwing up to try and get it out of your system, whatever it is, but your body doesn't like that. So immediately once you go over that, that threshold is, um, your body's going to stop making some natural endorphins. Um, so maybe instead of the hundred, it makes just for ease here, 95. Um, and then it it slowly keeps decreasing as you keep using opiates. Um, and so eventually you can get to a point where your body's not making any natural endorphins and that's when you're in the full addiction, you're sick all the time. Your body can't produce that natural high anymore. So you need 
things like morphine, heroin, fentanyl, all of that to get you, try to get you back to that, that normal state. Um, so when all that's happening and you're overflowing your receptors, you know, for, again, for ease, let's say you have five receptors, um, and then you go way overboard because you used IV heroin. So your body starts naturally making more receptors to try and find places for all these extra things to go, right? Um, so you, you'll start making all these endorphins, and that's also why we get sick is because now our body can't fill, let alone the five receptors we originally had. Now it has 10 receptors it's trying to fill, but we've already cut back because we're using things like morphine and heroin. Um, so that's why the withdrawal process is so painful is because those receptors are starving and they're crying for help and they're crying for something to fill them. Um, so the, what methadone and buprenorphine and Vivitrol all do, um, so I'm just going to speak on methadone here just so I'm not talking about three different medications at once. Uh, so what methadone does is it fills them, but then it also allows for the receptors to die off to get back to that normal, back down to that five, because it's fully filling those receptors and allowing your brain to restore itself. And that's part of when I mentioned earlier that it can take anywhere from a year to three years to five years, um, to heal itself because there's so much extra things that weren't naturally there. It's a lot easier with a white fart. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> you did great. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good description. I think, um, I think that's part of the stigma, right, is that it's just so misunderstood on a physical level and, like, a, from a physiology standpoint. So I think that's a good description of, yeah, thinking about the receptors as cups and golf balls filling the cups. I really liked that image. Um, if we want to scoop back to the resource slide, um, just as we wrap up, I want to point out all the different resources that we have provided um, so sorry, there's just a little bit of a delay on my screen, so it should be up here in just <laughs> a second. So that first one, Jess, that's your contact info, correct? People can reach out to you with questions or, you know, if they're trying to get themselves or somebody they know connected to care. Yep. So the, the first one on there is our, the first number, the 7205 three six five five seven one is our, our direct clinic line so if you call there you'll read our you'll reach our administrative assistant she was definitely you know there to help answer questions help facilitate the intake um but i also listed my my direct phone number on there so if you have questions about this presentation or if anything comes up later you can or you want to know about an intake that's my direct line um the second one and you can also email me as well perfect and then carla we've got the contact information for Boulder Creek and tell us how somebody might get connected if they want to see you and maybe potentially start on Suboxone. Absolutely. So calling the clinic and making an appointment is the best way to do it. Um, we do offer telehealth right now, but for something like this, I think um, if you're comfortable coming in person, that would be the best way to do it. You can also go through who guys which you'll yes. talk about next. Absolutely. <laughs> so the next resource on there is, first, it's my contact info, Amanda, um, who did the awkward introduction in the beginning. <laughs> um, feel free to call or email me with any questions yeah, regarding this presentation, any other forms of treatment or support. And then um, Shelby Souther, who is the other half of the PILLAR program. <laughs> She's our patient navigator, and she is certainly the one that will be helping you know, get connected to care, find out what's a good fit. Um, just talk about what are, what are your goals, um, for treatment? If it's to get sober, great. If it's just to use less, great. Let's have a conversation. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out. And then the other two are the 24 hour resources that I always like to include. So mental health partners here in Boulder, they're out on airport road. They have a 24 um, seven crisis walk-in center. It's um, right across the parking lot from the Boulder County jail. And they can help stabilize. They have syringe access there 24 hours a day. So they're a really great resource when, um, I mean, always, but certainly if, if other things are closed and not available. And then um, always like to give out the statewide crisis line. So anytime you're in a crisis, you can call or text, which is great because it's so much more discreet um, being able to text and have a conversation about any kind of mental health or substance use struggles and um, try to 
find some some other additional resources to get connected to. So with that, I'll come back over if you want to talk <laughs> to this time and just say another another great big thank you to everybody who's tuned in live or is watching the recording. Um, I want to say you will be getting a survey sent to the email address that you registered with. So please, 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 if you've got a couple minutes, fill that out. We, we listen to that feedback. We take that feedback into consideration to change anything about our presentations or our lectures. And we love to hear from you as the audience because tell us what you want to know. Also, since we are grant funded, it's just a really nice way to keep a pulse on how we're doing mm -hmm. and um, show our funders that uh, this is being effective or that we're, you know, we're meeting the needs of the community. So with that, I'll again say thank you. Have a fabulous evening or day, whatever time you're watching. And um, please continue to tune in. We are so, so appreciative of your support. Thank you. And ladies, just hang tight for just a minute.